Hey, it's uh, session two of Journalism 3130. Uh, Professor Stoll here. Uh, if it looks like I'm in a poultry barn, I'm not. I'm in our carriage house and I'm redoing the roof and got this kind of warehouse light um, helping me do that. But um, eventually it'll, it'll be, I'll be restored. Uh, what I want to talk about is a sort of trying to kill two birds with one stone with this week's assignment which is to read and listen to the podcast behind a Daily Beast story that I really found uh, very well written, very well researched, and, um, and wanted to share it with you. Um, it's written by Jeff Mache, and, uh, and he does a podcast that, I, that you need to listen to this week, preferably after you read the story. Uh, he does a podcast about being a freelancer and how he landed this piece and how he came up with it. And it's just it's just packed with insight in terms of you know being a great freelancer and being a great magazine writer, and and just being a great journalist in general. So, um, you know the goal here is that you have gone through um, session one, uh, that you've read every or vi or viewed or listened to every piece that I assigned, and now you're ready to move on to an actual writing project. And in a second, I'll get into the goals for that. But you're, you, you've got the advantage now of having several pieces that I've assigned you that you can use for reference in the second uh, session. You can go back and look at them and sort of put some of the pieces together. Um, it's very important that you um, take notes on this lecture because I'm going to make some, make some points that you're going to want to reference and not have to watch this again um, as you think about this first assignment. The assignment is somewhat well articulated in the Moodle documents that I gave you, other documents that I gave you on Moodle. But um, I'm going to explain for you what the goal is. The goal is to hit as close to 400 words as you can. And one of the reasons I pick 400 words is that's a basic news story. 400 words is pretty good for just a basic who, what, where, when, and why, and a nut, and a, and a nut graph, and a... And, and, and sort of some broadening in a story. You don't get much further than, than that in 400 words. The typical story that I wrote in my career was between 750 and 1,000 words, and my columns would, would run about 1,200 words. But those, those 400 words are critical because if you can't make your point in 400 words, you probably don't belong in the profession. It's hard to make points in 50 words. You know, we talk about 50-word leads or less, in journalism a lot. It's, it's hard to, to really tell somebody what the story is about. I understand that. And that's why long-form journalism takes on a different, different path. But you don't need a whole book to tell a story by any stretch. And, it, and, and, and one of the things about 400 words is it, it represents an attention span. Um, most people don't read to 700 words. They read the first several paragraphs. And if you're looking at, let's say, you know, 50 words per paragraph, it's fair to ask people, you know, 50 to 70 words, you know, to get through seven or eight paragraphs is a lot. Um, so start thinking in terms of word count rather than inches or, a, you know, a page double spaced. Forget all that. You need to think about how much time you're asking your reader to devote to your story or to the introduction to your story. In this case, we're, we're looking at introduction. The thing about this story that I've assigned this week, which is called How an Ex-Cop Rigged McDonald's Monopoly Game and Stole Millions, How Mc, you know, which is McScam, you know, uh, it's kind of a planned McDonald's. Um, the, I'm going to move this just a minute. Um, the, uh, the, the intro to the story is brilliant because it pulls you in and then it tells you what the story is about in that 400 word window. And very few stories that go for the long form do that. I'm thinking about a few that I've read in the last couple of years that I really loved. One, one story, the intro, um, and like I said, I want you to stick with us because there's two points that we need to fi figure out. The first is just introduction to a story. You know, this is a several thousand word story. I mean, it's a mega story. It takes you a long time to read it. It's way different than Truman Capote's stories, though, because that was a book. And he had all kinds of time to develop that. And section one, which you read in The New Yorker, was just one section of four that he wanted to publish. But, you know, a story I read a couple of years ago about a big tornado in Joplin, Missouri, uh, had the headline. This was the headline. Heavenly Father, I love you all. I love everyone. Jesus, 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 I love you all. 
Love all of you. This is found in Esquire. That was the headline that they ran with the story, the headline. And it's captivating, right? I mean, you don't have that kind of space in the newspaper and even in a magazine. But online, where more and more content is consumed, you can have a headline that's, you know, whatever, how many ever words that's long. And that's a captivating way to pull people in. And then there's a subhead or a subheadline where it says on May 22nd, a three-quarter mile tornado carved a six-mile long path through Joplin, Missouri, killing 160. Unable to escape, two dozen strangers sought shelter in a gas station's walk-in cooler while the funnel ripped apart every building, car, and living thing around. This is their story. And then the story begins. And the story begins by dicing it up into each of those people's experience, you know, starting with their trip or why they were going to the party store in the first place. Totally different than the McDonald's story that we're studying this week and not a concise way to intro a story because they start talking about a man named Ruben to start and Ruben then gives way to four other people's stories. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a brilliant technique, but it's not what we're talking about in terms of trying to grab somebody and tell somebody immediately what they're about in the intro of the story. The headline in this story actually does that. One of the most popular and best stories in, in, written in the last couple of years was a, was a piece in, in GQ uh, by uh, Rachel Ganesa about uh, Dylan Roof. And he was the American terrorist who, who uh, shot m multiple people at uh, Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston several years ago. And, you know, uh, Rachel tracked down uh, people close to Dylan to tell the story of 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 how he was kind of created or how he was kind of bred in the society that he lived in it's a long story um and it begins with uh, a resuscitation of it begins right at the beginning of this of where she thinks the story which is the shooting and but you know it's not clear again what the story is about unless it's you know is this about the shooting or is this about Dylan Roof um, that's another way to start a story, right? Another way to start a story is with the most compelling and vivid details. Like the tornado story I told you about didn't start with the tornado. You know, there's brilliant descriptions of a tornado in there and what it does to, you know, everything it touches. But that's not where the way that story begins. This story on Dylan Roof begins with the shooting. And then it works backwards into the life and times of Dylan Roof, his, Roof, his father, his mother, his friends, his influences. Um, another one that came out a couple years ago, uh, from the publication that I've worked at for 13 years in the wall street journal is called the FBI lost our son, a very long form of journalism story about a guy named Billy Riley who worked, uh, counterterrorism, counterterrorism for the FBI. And this story begins with his parents on a walk in Michigan. Um, uh, and, uh, and, it's, it's a long kind of winding way to get into the fact that this walk in Michigan is consequential to them learning that their son had been lost, okay? Um, again, another way to start a story. I would encourage you to go back through Malcolm Gladwell's. Just listen to the beginning. How did Malcolm Gladwell begin America Stole My Heart or whatever that was about the French fries or Ethan Hawke's myth, uh, moth speech, you know, when he tells the story, oh, do stepfather, how does he begin the story. Go back again now and look at the beginning of each of those stories. How does, now that you know the story, it's really effective to go back. Well, how did they begin the story? Because, you know, you know the story and now you know how they decided to start the story, which is a pretty effective tool. You've had some time to kind of percolate in it. In Cold Blood's a good example. That's a long book. And the way that Truman Capote d decides to start the story is by going to Holcomb. And talking about the city and the times and the life and times of the family that is murdered. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's another technique. And, you know, if you just start to get acquainted with that, you start to see, oh, there's so many different ways to start a story. And if you think about it, you know, the way that the clutters are introduced in in um, in, in Cold Blood is not a efficient way to tell a story. Like if you were to sit down and say, I need to tell you about this murder that happened last week, you wouldn't tell the whole story of Rochester, Michigan and, you know, the whole background of everybody in the family that was murdered. You'd start with the murder um, because you got to get it 
done quickly because you've got somebody's attention span so quickly. I want you to think in those terms as we start looking at, you know, a writing project here is that you don't have a lot of time to get somebody's attention. And the reason I want you to start thinking about that is less about, you know, what it's going to take to write a great long form story that has all kinds of different ways to start a story and what it takes to get an editor to care about your story even before you get to write it. Okay. Because what I see in this McDonald's story that we're writing this week in the Daily Beast, what I see is an ability to write 400 words and tell somebody, this is a heck of a story. You need to keep reading it. Um, that's what an editor wants to, for the, to have cross their desk when they're, um, when they're thinking about what they want to publish and they want reporters to pursue. Now, um, let me let me just get into a little bit of the mechanics of the way that Jeff handled this in the Daily Beast when he wrote the story in March uh, in in July of two, twenty eighteen. He starts by telling the story of a film crew that shows up in in, in Rhode Island, and a, uh, a a man who had won or been told that they won a Monopoly comp competition that had been going on since nineteen eighty seven. I remember these competitions very well from my youth, and so maybe this is why I connected with it. The odds were high, were, were very, very much stacked against. The odds, were, the odds of him winning were low, very much stacked against him. And, um, and, but, you know, he, he won one of the two ways that you can to, to, to get the, the grand prize. Um, uh, you know, talks, this, talks about, you know, a, a McDonald's spokesman being in the home. Um, it it has a lot of deep color. It's it's cinematic. Okay, even this introduction is cinematic, and it goes on. I mean, basically, if you if you look at the structure, there's one paragraph, two paragraph of cinem of cin cin cinematic writing, three paragraphs of cinematic writing with a lot of color and detail. Who was there? How did this happen? Um, and then, uh oh, something's wrong something's amiss. Not everything is as it seems it is. It's not a great big celebration. They suspected that Hoover was not a lucky winner, but part of a major criminal conspiracy to defraud the fast food chain of millions of dollars. The two men behind the camera were not McDonald's from McDonald's. They were undercover agents from the FBI. This was a missting, mixting. Right there, you are pulled in to read this story. Because if you had any affinity, any recollection of the McDonald's, like me growing up, and you're like, hey, let's go to McDonald's and try to win this Monopoly game. You're thinking, oh, this is going to be an interesting story about people who won. You know, I mean, you know from the headline that something's not right. But you don't know that as the editor who wants to buy this story. And you don't know that if you just came into this story cold and didn't read the headline. And so the lead, the lead of the story, which goes on for these three, parag these three paragraphs, and then boom, a quick four-word paragraph that says this was a mixed sting. The lead of the story is ba basically a pitch letter, okay? I mean, with some changes. You're not going to write a pitch letter in this class because there's no real good way to write a pitch letter. I mean, this is as good of a way to write a pitch letter as any. What you would do is you would say, after this was a mixed sting, you'd say, M Mr. Stoll, I want to write the story about the FBI's highly organized, long-time investigation into something as wholesome and American and memorable and lovable as the McDonald's Monopoly contest that we all remember. And you'd give some bulleted details and then you'd say, let me know, I plan to bring this story in at 10,000 words, can deliver by July. That's what you do in an in a, in a, in a, in a introduction. That's what you, I'm sorry, in a pitch letter. And that's what Jeff does very well in this introduction is he makes a deal with the reader. This is interesting. This is worth your time. Trust me. This is a great story. Now, as you pivot from reading and listening to this podcast to thinking about what you're going to do, the first thing is you got to move fast, okay? You have to always be thinking about... Um, about your um, your ideas, okay? Kind of like Eminem and his you know yellow legal pads. You have to be thinking about these ideas all the time because you never know when you can pounce. You know, as a as a columnist for many years, I had a list of ideas and I had stuff that I was reporting out 
because I never knew when the when the golden moment would come, the silver bullet would come when I could actually write the story. Like it might be a, a window of time when, you know, this this idea is really relevant, or it might be somebody calls me back and finally gives me the interview that I'm looking for. But you know, you always have to have ideas, and I think if you thought about it very long, you'd know that you you have proximity and you have access to some really good stories that you can tell. And so, you know, you can't half-ass this. You cannot just say, oh, I'm going to write 400 words about something I think I know, okay? So I thought about this today. You know, what are some stories that I could potentially tell right now? Um, I could tell the story of the, the lion's, the ex-lion's chaplain and how he was unceremoniously dismissed a few years ago by the, by, the, by the organization. The Detroit Lions just let him go. After 25 years of working for free, they just were like, we don't need you anymore. You know, no watch, no commemorative, you know, certificate, nothing. Just like, bye, thank you. And he's like, what? And I could, I could tell Dave's story. I would have to spend a lot of time with him talking on the phone and maybe talking to others who were affected by him and make sure ver verify the story. But I could tell that story because I have access to Dave. And the big point would be, you know, this is why the Lions suck as an organization. This is why the Detroit Lions are the worst football team to ever have been, you know, populated the planet. Because they don't care about excellence in people and they have no idea how excellence is bred and how to be, you know, good stewards of the people that they have. Um, another story, just almost off the top of my head, uh, but that's just somebody I know. And you know people like that too. You know people who have fascinating stories to tell that have wider and bigger implications than, um, than um, you would, 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 would otherwise think. The other, the other, another story that I could tell is how frustrating it is to, to try to go to a Mac computer store, an Apple store. Um, you don't think this is long form, but one of the things that are the most happy memories in our lives is going to the Apple store back before COVID, right? This was so cool. You just go and play with gadgets and, and lust after these devices and, you know, talk to the genius bar and, and feel good about society and technology. Now it's completely changed. And I know this because I've been to a Mac store four times in the last month. And every time I go, I get treated like a criminal. I get treated like I have COVID. I have to stand outside in line at Partridge Creek. I have to show that I belong there. There's no easy access. I, I don't want to go to the Apple store. And I could write a long form story about the, the way that COVID has completely changed the experience of going to the Apple store. Um, and I'd have to find you know, other people to talk to and other people with similar examples, maybe on some like you know, web chats or something like that, some message boards. But I, but I could tell that story, and I could tell that story effectively. Now, I, I need to gather enough information to write an introduction to that story now because I want to sell it. I want to – I mean I did – you know, you do this all the time is you're, you're thinking in your head all the time. You're thinking in stories. So it's not hard to kind of do this. But start – the first thing you do is kind of draw a circle around your life. What, where, what are the things that I've been doing recently? Where are the places that I've been? What are the stories that I'm dying to tell? Maybe this is even pre-COVID. Maybe this is a story that you pitched somewhere and it didn't go anywhere. But you, you sort of draw a circle around your life and where are the places that I go? What are the experiences? What are the changes that I've seen recently? Um, you know, who are the people that I know that I have just phenomenal stories? D don't worry, first of all, how to get the story done. Just find in your life a story that's worth telling. Um, it could be something that's not even in your life. It could be something that you've read and you're like, I want to follow up on this. I, I think it's worth following up on, you know, something that's happened, something that I read about, something that I know about from several years ago. You know, one of the, one of the, one of the names that I'll give you is a guy named Kay Felder. Kay was a, a, a an outstanding basketball player for the Oakland Golden Grizzlies uh, several years ago. And he's really struggled to make it as a professional basketball player. He's, he is a professional basketball player. He was in the NBA for several years. But now he's playing in a place called Xinjiang. And Xinjiang is a place where I went to college before I went to Oakland University. I was in Xinjiang. It's on the northwest corner of China. It's where Urumqi is. It's where a lot of uh, Muslims are oppressed by the communist government. He's playing basketball professionally there. It would be very interesting to track him down and tell his story. 
um, you know, he's not a, an immediate, you know, great basketball star. He's kind of a blast from the past. He's 5'9". He was drafted in the second round by um, Cleveland. And it'd be nice to track him down and tell his story. I mean, you look, you know what I'm talking about. That in your life, there are stories that are worth telling. And you're going to say, well, how am I going to do that in a week? How am I going to, by June, you know, January 27th, get you what you need in order to convince you that, you know, I've done my homework on this? Um, and my answer is, you can do it. You can definitely do it. I'm, 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 I'm pulling up the, um, the, the details of the assignment. Um, it can be done. It doesn't have to be perfect. It needs to be well told, okay? I mean, I want you to think about how am I going to grab John's attention so that when he re reads this first 400 words, he wants to read more. You're not really writing this as a pitch. You're writing this as the beginning of the story, okay? You're writing this as if you're going to keep writing, but you stop at 400 words or 390 words or 410, 415. You don't go to 500, okay? And you don't just stop abruptly. You stop with saying, this is the point of my story. You're basically writing a nut graph at the end of a narrative. Um, and that should make sense from your time in, um, in feature writing. Um, the, uh, the, I lost my train of thought. Hang on. So, um, this is due on the 27th. This is what I would typically do if I was actually, um, lecturing. So this is due on the 27th. So we're, we're far away from when you actually have to turn that in. But you can start sending me notes now saying, hey, I was thinking about this story or that story. And I'm just going to say, hey, you, what you need to do is you need to convince me that it's worth reading. Um, if it's a story that's a dud, I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to say you didn't do a good enough job with color and narration and character development in these 400 words. You didn't introduce me to anything. You just told me an idea without fleshing it out. And I used to get in trouble for that a lot at the Wall Street Journal. I used to get in trouble because I was never really driving the story to my editor and saying, this is what my story is about. I just, I have just a general idea that I want to do. No, I need, I need to give the nuts and bolts of what the story is about. Well, how do I do that? How do I do that without writing the story? You don't write the story, you research the story. You can't pitch, sell, and start a story that you don't know. You would never start writing a 10,000 word story that you didn't know. You'd wait until you had the facts, okay? Maybe you'd write it in pieces, like the ideas, but you'd never sit down to really write the story until you knew the story. You have to know the story. So between now and when you turn this in, you need to get to know the story that you're trying to tell. You're not going to tell the whole story, but you're going to introduce a story that you know darn well. When Ethan Hawke started his story, Ode to the Stepfather, he knew the whole story, right? He's not just telling you a story that he thinks he knows, he knows intimately the story and he's had to taper and edit and cut and censor himself to get to a point where he's now telling you the best part of the story. Because when you start a story, what, what do you say? Where do I begin? Well, let me tell you about X, Y, and Z. And somebody's like, oh, tell me more. I did, one of the longest form pieces that I did at the Wall Street Journal was about a man named Ed Whitaker. And Ed Whitaker had run AT&T uh, before coming to Detroit to run General Motors. And a Ed Whitaker was a legend uh, as an executive, being able to be like hard-nosed and, you know, make a big important decisions and make, you know, gutsy calls and turned AT&T into, into a powerhouse telecom company. And then he retired and then General Motors went bankrupt. And when General Motors went bankrupt, the government, which took over General Motors, called Ed and said, can you run General Motors? And he, and he did. And I, and I was covering General Motors at the time and I needed to write a very long piece on Ed Whitaker who is this guy and he was already starting to run General Motors and I decided the most compelling way to start his story after doing a ton of research a ton and going and visiting him like I spent days with him the way that I decided to tell his story was by talking to the students who he had been teaching while retired well in between gigs before he went to GM and after AT&T he was teaching and students were terrified of this man because he was such a tough judge. He was such a tough grader. And he would he would tell you exactly what he thought in front of everybody. And this was indicative of, the, of his style of management. So I thought, well, I'll start in the classroom to tell a story about the way that he is in the executive suite, if that makes sense. Um, so the first thing is it's cinematic. Could I take 
readers into the classroom and show through one or two students what it was like. I did. I could. I told her story or his story about what it was like to be in Ed Whitaker's classroom, some cinematic materials. What, what color was the class? What were the lights like? You know, um, what were the desks like? What, what, was, what was the student wearing when they gave the presentation? How is Ed Whitaker? What, what is his Texas drawl like? What kind of cowboy boots does he wear? That kind of thing. So it, it brings people in so they can kind of see the scene as it unfolds. You don't want to just be, and then he said, he said, she said, he said, she said. You know, great writing it has disembodied quotes, meaning they might not even be direct quotes. They might be paraphrases that kind of give the sense that I don't have to have the reader narrate everything for me. I, you know, in terms of he said, then she said, then he said. But you have people saying things after establishing them who they are. Dialogue can be this way because dialogue is moving. And it's like, you know, you, you, you kind of get a sense of who's saying what without then Jim said, then Bill said, then Jim said, then Bill said. But you're, you're able to kind of give readers the sense of what people were saying and thinking because you are confident in what was said and thought. Um, you see a lot of this in Truman Capote and in Cold Blood. You see quite a bit of this in, um, in, 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 in the McDonald's story. Um, it foreshadows details that will be fleshed out later. In the McDonald's story, yeah, you're going to get a ton of details about what the McDonald's uh, contest was. You're going to get a ton of details about the FBI sting. And you're going to get a ton of details about the investigation and the criminal activity. You're not going to get it all in the intro. You can't fit it there. But you have to be able to foreshadow some of that. And the last thing it does, it ends with this boom, aha. This is McSting. This is the FBI's takedown of the all-American, lovable Monopoly game that McDonald's hoisted for so many years. And you get this, you get this as stories are told, right? The story gets a, like an initial climax. And that initial climax is like this pow. This story is powerful because it is about X, Y, and Z, you know, um, you think about Trump and stories that will be told about his presidency. They'll, they'll start in the White House. They'll start in the Oval Office. Or they'll start on Air Force One. But they'll seek to tell a bigger story. And that bigger story will be fleshed out very high up. And then, and then the story will kind of cascade itself into the narrative by starting with background and then moving forward again. This is what we call a nut graph. You know what this is by now. You know what, in a nutshell, this story is about X, Y, and Z. It can be said in four words. It can be said in a hundred. Okay, you make up your mind. Don't steal from the narrative on top to make this very complex and prescriptive nut graph happen. Um, you know, try to keep it concise. This is tough. I understand it. And some of you might say, I'm not ready for this. And you know, if you haven't had feature writing, you might not be ready for this. But it's an experimentation and it's something that you kind of workshop. It's not something you perfect. So you're thinking, I'm going to tell a story and then I'm going to say why this story is important to a bigger story. Boom. And then you're going to stop. Tell a story. Why is it important to a bigger story? I can't tell that story if I don't know the whole story, but I need to bring that story into a very deliverable small package. So I'm tapering and editing and censoring myself so that I can fit it into a quick story that leads to a bigger story. Okay, that's like putting the foot in the boot, right? The boot's bigger, but the foot needs to be pretty powerful to be able to get in the boot in the first place, okay? Um, if you have any questions about this, send me an email. Um, this is due January 27th at midnight. Um, uh, if there's a problem with meeting that, you need to tell me now. Uh, it shouldn't be uh, from the moment that I'm – that gives you 10 days from watching this, ten nine nine days from watching this to do that. You need to do some interviews. You need to do some research and investigation. You need to know your stuff. I need to know that you know your stuff, okay? And I need to say I, I think this person knows more than just this introduction. All right, I've gone on for half an hour, which is too much time. But um, hopefully you understand the story. Uh, now go out and find out what that story is. I'm not picking it for you. You're picking it. Uh, and I don't want to hear from you on January 26th what your story is. I need to know soon so that I can kind of tell you whether it's right or wrong. If you haven't answered the question at the end of the first lecture, I need you to do that now. I need to know that you've watched the first lecture and that you're ready to answer the story. Some of you have not gotten back to me. Most of you have. But um, I need to know that you've watched it because it's indicative of a person who's doing the rest of the work. 
if if I don't get answers to those types of questions, if you don't get back to me relatively soon with some ideas on the story that you're going to tell, then I know that you're not reading this stuff in a timely manner, okay? Um, finally, read and listen to the podcast and the story before uh, you pitch anything to me, okay? You need to understand uh, Mick's scam, and you need to understand the Daily Beast story, and you need to understand Jeff's perspective behind it. It can be done in a few hours, so get it done. And then move on to your own ideation and story conception and then send me a note when you're ready. Thanks.